Pictioning. Dr. Carroll tipped the box of fresh Crayola crowns, a broad, ranging 24-pack, not the skimpy 8-pack, until each crown spilled forth. Basil Cosgrave marveled wide-eyed at the colored sticks of wax. She loved the way the grown-ups responded to her drawings. She did not discriminate when it came to drawing utensils. A marker was as good a tool as colored pencils, crowns, or the most sought-after oil paint. Go ahead, Dr. Carol cooed. Basil's fingers danced as she decided which color to start with. There was something magical about the color blue. Blue went with everything. It had a wider range of emotions than all the other colors. Pictioning with Carol begins, Dr. Carol whispered, offering Basil a friendly smile. Basil took to the color blue, creating large and small circles concentric and overlapping circles, her right arm going as fast as she can make it go. Basil, can you tell me what's going on in the picture? The flood in the basement, Basil muttered, her voice sweet and squeaky. That's beautiful. Yeah, too many dead people, Basil sighed, adding yet another blue stick figure into the chaos of circles. Carol, who is Mitch? Basil asked sweetly, tilting her head slightly. Can you tell me who you think Mitch is? You're a pretty little girl. A deep hissing growl came from Basil's mouth. Dr. Carol struggled to keep calm. She pursed her lips to keep from letting out a cry of horror. Don't tell anyone or you'll get in trouble too. That inhuman voice simpered. Basil snapped her neck in Dr. Carroll's direction. Her pupils constricted into narrow slits like viper's eyes, just sclera and pupil. Her beautiful rosebud lips stretched into a sinister grin. Jim Carroll, hell is real. I'm burning. You'll soon join me. Basil hissed, throwing her head back and cackled a wet horse cackle. <laughs> Dr. Carroll's flush radiated into an all-over crimson. She slowly rose to her full height, smoothed her cardigan, then rapidly shuffled across the room. Dr. Benjamin Elleron slowly strolled into the room, whistling a jaunty tune. Dr. Elleron thought he hid the fact that he was ordained and that his prefix doctor came from a PhD instead of an MD well. But, despite his plain clothes persona, Basil could see his holiness. He had that smug aura about him that all clergymen from the newest to the most senior had about them. Basil, that was not nice what you did to Dr. Carroll, Dr. Alleron and Tist. What do you care, Father? Basil cackled as she mindlessly continued to fill the page with blue. You think I can't smell the stench of frankincense on you, Father? Basil laughed a wet, hacking laugh. <laughs> I, su I suppose I could smell worse, Dr. Elrond replied, a little too jovial for Basil's liking. What do you want, Father? Basil threw him a closed mouth sneer, then returned to watch her own hand work deliberately on its own. Part 1 A half-page announcement was printed in the Sunday paper for all of society to see that Mr. Rhett Cosgrave and Marla Cosgrave welcomed a daughter, Basil Ann Cosgrave. The announcement had a photo and the two-month-old child in a lacy christening gown. Her big green eyes pulling focus and her rosebud lips bearing the hint of a smile. At only two months, Basil Cosgrave already had a full head of auburn curls. She was undeniably beautiful. Marla and Red's marriage had been unplanned, as was the arrival of Basil. Red Cosgrave III had been seen actress Marla Hennings while his messy divorce from wife number two was in full swing. Before the ink was dry, Marla and Rhett announced their wedding. 
and two months after the wedding, Basil Ann Cosgrave was born, though her arrival was not announced until she was two months old. At birth, she went into cardiac arrest and had to be resuscitated. She spent the better part of two months in the neonatal intensive care unit to monitor her heart. Marla made the unconventional decision to raise her daughter instead of hiring a nanny. Basil reportedly was ahead on all developmental fronts. According to Marla, Basil began talking at nine months old. Basil could walk all on her own on her first birthday. What Marla didn't tell anyone was that behind closed doors, Basil was a bit peculiar. She could be heard having full conversations when she was all alone. The range in her vocabulary was impressive and yet concerning. It almost seemed as though Basil was attending private lessons with an unseen tutor. Basil began having seizures too. Absence seizures is what the doctors called it. I think she might have a rare case of childhood schizophrenia, Marla confided in Basil's neurologist. I'm looking at all options, Miss Cosgrave. I promise you we'll get to the bottom of this, their neurologist asserted. Part 2 Dr. Hayes was the first child psychologist the Cosgraves were referred to. Dr. Hayes lasted exactly two months before he took his own life. Dr. Lockhart was the second. She lasted a little over a month. She died in a car crash. Dr. Elleron, you're our only hope. Marla sobbed behind the privacy of Dr. Elleron's ancient oak door. We didn't know what else to do, Rhett muttered. Rhett looked a mixture of ashamed and helpless as he sat beside Marla. How can our minister think Basil is possessed? Marla mouthed the last word, too ashamed to say it out loud. I've seen the exorcist, Dr. Alaron. Basil is a beautiful, sweet child. He isn't old enough to use a Ouija board. She isn't turning green or throwing up pea soup. Besides, we've taken her to church many Sundays and she seems fine. Dr. Elrond nodded along as the Cosgraves voiced their concerns and objections to the idea of possession. Dr. Elrond had Mother Superior Joan escort the Cosgraves throughout the monastery. He needed a moment to review Basil's medical record. In the 20 years he'd been a clergyman, he'd only seen two cases of convincing demonic possessions. Despite what the zealots and sensationalists would have the public believe, demonic possessions were not on the rise or common. It was his reserved skepticism that earned him two doctorates, a doctorate in child psychology and theology. It was his dedication to fact-finding that relegated him to the administration of St. Mary the Immaculate Mother Hospital. Dr. Elleron sat forward in his desk chair and hunched over Basil Cosgrave's medical records. There were rudimentary shape, swirls, and lines to indicate his story, but no definitive evidence linking the deaths of the two previous providers to Basil's drawings. Dr. Elleron called Dr. Carroll to his office. He shared the notes and drawings with her. Do you think that she is simply drawing the future or is she drawing what she wants to will into being? Dr. Oleron asked. I don't know, Dr. Carroll answered, sucking in a harsh breath. Dr. Carroll sat with the notes for a long moment. Do you think there is a research project in this case, Father? Dr. Oleron nodded. Dr. Carroll sat taller in the undersized chair that was part of the playset in the therapy room. Sister Evangelisa stepped into the room with Basil by the hand. Basil, this is Dr. Carroll. You're going to play with her for a little while? Basil, this is Dr. Carroll. You're going to play with her for a little while? Is that all right? Sister Evangelista said softly, hunching in the slightest to make eye contact with Basil. Basil smiled and nodded, her head of auburn curls bouncing. Sister Evangelista stepped out and gently shut the door behind her. Dr. Carroll offered Basil a friendly smile. 
Basil didn't bother sliding the unoccupied. Basil didn't bother sliding the unoccupied chair out from the table. She was small enough to simply squeeze into the seat as it was. Dr. Carroll presented Basil with a large piece of paper and a set of markers. Have you ever played Pictionary? Dr. Carroll asked. Pictionary? Basil asked, then shook her head to both their questions. Pictionary is a game where you draw pictures and you can tell me what you're drawing or what you're thinking, or if you like, you can draw what you're thinking or feeling. Do you want to try it? <clears throat> Basil smiled, her cherub cheeks nearly swallowing her eyes. Dr. Carroll watched as Basil picked out a blue marker and set to work. For a nearly two-year-old, Basil was average in height and weight. She was appropriately dressed in a pink cotton dress, cardigan, and glossed Mary Janes. What stood out was the rate at which she was hitting major developmental milestones. She was able to grasp the fat marker in her fist and make relatively advanced scribbles and lines. Basil paused, looked at her drawing, and then attempted an oblong shape. It's waning. Is it raining in the picture? No, it's waning later, Basil insisted. Dr. Carroll regretted not checking the weather in that moment. <laughs> How do you know? Basil pointed to her head. Is blue your favorite color? Basil nodded. Do you like animals? Yes. Do you have a pet at home? I have pets everywhere. Oh, what kind of pets? I have many, many, many birds. I have... Basil flared her arms out. This many lions and tigers. Wow. How long does it take to feed them all? Basil stopped drawing, stopped drawing and set her marker down. She fixed Dr. Carroll with a look of confusion. That's silly. I don't feed them. The lions eat the people, the tigers eat the lions, and the birds eat the tigers. Basil snickered. The snicker unsettled Dr. Carroll more than Basil's answer. Snickering was far more nuanced than a simple giggle, far too advanced for a two-year-old. When the session was over and Sister Evangelista had collected the child, Dr. Carroll studied the drawing. It was just a series of streaks, fat ones, thin ones, some darker than others. She turned the paper right side up. It was a first-person perspective of what felt like a windshield and the vertical streaks were the shadows of the wipers as they whipped back and forth to clear the windshield. Dr. Eleron had to wait five days before he got to see firsthand one of Basil's seizures. The Cosgraves were playing tea party in one of the playrooms. All the playrooms were monitored as were every nook and cranny except for the sleeping quarters for the families of patients. Marla and Basil were practicing table manners as they pretended to sip tea. Rhett, Rhett interacted with his wife and daughter, but did not seem immersed. Stiffened, then went catatonic. Dr. Eleron and Sister Evangelista, along with two nurses, quickly shuffled down the corridor as the nurse's station buzzed to life. Dr. Eleron knelt beside Rhett with his daughter in his arms. Her eyes were no longer her own. The pupils were constricted into vertical slits. Her eyes darted from side to side until a noticeable membrane formed over her eyes. In a matter of seconds, she sat up and looked around the room. As she blinked, Dr. Eleron noticed the membrane articulate, then retreat to either side of her eyes before her pupils dilated and became circular again. Sister Evangelista was the first to recoil from the child. One morning, as she escorted Basil to her session with Dr. Carroll, Basil glanced up at Sister Evangelista. Mags, why did you leave me to die? Basil asked coyly. Sister Evangelista didn't break stride, but her heart was drumming in her ears. What are you saying? Why did you leave me to die? It's not your fault. The missionary set the fire, you know. They wanted you. They wanted to kill all of us. This is how they make you believe in their false god. They take away hope. Mommy and Daddy want you to know they still love you. 
Sister Evangelista quickened her steps and gladly relinquished the child to Dr. Carroll. The Beginning of the End Dr. Carroll and Sister Evangelista were visibly shaking as they huddled in Dr. Elrond's small office. I don't think the child is possessed, Dr. Elrond muttered, more to himself than his audience. Father, she knows things she shouldn't, Sister Evangelista whispered. Dr. Elrond nodded. She is unnatural, Dr. Carroll added. I've seen dozens of cases of schizophrenia, Father. I've never seen a patient completely change their voice. Once more, Dr. Elrond nodded. He was aware his scholarly pensiveness was annoying his audience. There was a characteristic quirk that irritated many. What demon isn't phased by holy relics and spiritual artifacts? Sister Evangelista asked. Father, I think her drawings are both prophecies and curses, Dr. Carroll added. I think we might be dealing with the beginning of the end, Dr. Elrond replied. What? Both women asked in unison. Isn't there supposed to be a ritual or sacrifice of some kind to bring the end of days? Dr. Carroll asked. Dr. Elrond nodded as he paced the length of his small desk. I believe we were wrong, Dr. Elrond began. And the four horsemen, Sister Evangelista asked. I believe we have already seen the beginning of the end. There is no ritual required when we have hailed the four horsemen ourselves. There need be no ritual. <clears throat> there need be no rituals to summon the Antichrist when every day we perform such rituals. We sacrifice one another every day. As we speak, our nation seems to be falling apart. We are an easy species to divide. Dr. Elrond chuckled to himself. There was no warmth in it. The White Horseman is said to bring war and disease. Well, we've been warring and infecting one another for centuries, haven't we? Humanity is much like the child's drawings. We are a circular creature. Dr. Eleron fixed his gaze on his small and carefully curated collection of books. We heralded the Four Horsemen ourselves. We have performed all the necessary rituals to summon the Antichrist daily as a species. We have done all the work. Slowly, Sister Evangelista and Dr. Carroll turned their attention to the doorway of Father Aleron's office. The small figure was further dwarfed by the sheer size of the doorframe. I've never been so proud of humankind, came a deep and guttural growl and a cacophony of laughter. Father Aleron hung his head as he turned to face the beautiful face of Basil Cosgrave. Her halo of auburn hair, her green viper eyes, and her lips stretched into a broad, jovial, and yet sinister grin. As Father Aleron looked into the child's eyes, he saw not the future, but the past. We are all doomed, Father Aleron murmured to himself.